Right, okay, everybody, if you can hear me, um, I am not Nourish Scotland. I'm just using Nourish Scotland Zoom account. So if you don't know me, this is Margaret, Margaret Lear. Um, so I've dragged you all into this. And this is a very warm welcome to everybody that's here and everybody that's about to be here to the online version of Our Food, Our Land, um, protecting the planet and preparing for the future. It's a little bit different from the original format in that there'll be too many of you, hopefully, to have discussions, though they will come later. There'll be further Zoom meetings for those. The format of today is that Keisha is going to give her uh, talk to begin with. And while Keisha's speaking, you'll all remain muted. You won't be able to interrupt her, okay? It's mainly because we don't want to hear your washing machines in the background. Um, after Keisha's talk, then you get the opportunity to answer questions and to make, uh, ask questions and to make points. If you could, um, please indicate that you want to speak, um, not by putting a finger up, because you may not all be visible. Some of you may not have your video switched on, or you may not be able to use it. And by all means, do that. I want to make a point. But there's a Zoom group, Zoom group chat window on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you just indicate in there that you would like to speak, um, then I will unmute you and you can say your piece, okay? We'll then go through the same procedure for uh, James Murdoch, our second speaker from Extinction Rebellion, and uh, then we'll, we'll have questions after that. We are here definitely until 12.30. Unfortunately, we're not getting filmed, so if we do run over a little bit, it'll not matter too much. You can, of course, leave the meeting at any time that you want, um, but we hope that you stay and uh, hope you enjoy. Now, if you're able to switch your video on and you do so, that would be wonderful. Um, oh, Julia suddenly appeared. That's good. That means maybe Julia's not on my big screen anymore. I'll check in a minute. Um, and I think I'll just hand over to you, Keisha, and you can start going on. I'm going to mute myself and unmute Keisha. Hello everyone. Great. I can't quite see myself yet. So hello everyone. I've no idea what my hair looks like. <laughs> um, first of all, I need to um, apologize because in normal circumstances, I'd be way more prepared. But this last week has, I'm sure for many of you, been uh, quite difficult. Um, and in many ways, it's actually underlined a lot of the issues that we're going to be uh, talking about today. Um, the fact that the main headlines are all about people not being able to get enough food, um, about people hoarding, thinking about themselves rather than about you know the general public, um, is is all unbelievably relevant to what we have to talk about today. So my first point is that we need to be kind, and you may think to yourself what on earth has that got to do with food and what does it have to do with climate but actually if we start being a bit kinder to ourselves and to people around us to our communities to the land around us and also to the animals around us then we may actually have a fighting chance of not just being able to deal with COVID-19 but also being able to deal with climate change, which has not gone away, is still very much in existence. The reason I'm saying be kind is because kindness involves having a conscience and being a bit understanding of the decisions you make and the consequences they have on everything else. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know what the answers are which I think is one of the most frustrating things about the question of food and climate change, or just food in general, is that so many of the questions we have don't have simple answers. There is no silver bullet to dealing with climate change. There are lots of different ways of dealing with it. So it's not only about being kind to other people, it's also about being kind to yourself 
understanding that trying to find the answers is difficult and that you will not always get it right. I have a, a fantastic story about eight years ago. Um, my mom was living with us. We were up in Ab Aberdeen and uh, I divided the shopping list into two and I'd asked my mom to go and buy the fruit and veg and I went enough to, to do the other stuff. And I found her about half an hour later and uh, she said, I can't do it, Keisha, I can't do it. I can't fulfill all of your requirements about where the stuff comes from and how sustainable it is. And she was basically having an absolute frothy in the supermarket. And to be honest, that can be as intimidating every day in terms of making our, our food choices. It is hard, but if you find questions and you look for answers, then every step can make it a little bit easier. So one of those questions, which might be a little bit controversial, is the question about local. Now, when I was growing up in South Africa, the phrase was local is lekker, lekker being an Afrikaans word meaning good. And being a member of Perth Organic Gardeners, we like growing our own food. Um, so local is, local is fantastic. And local is fantastic for a whole raft of reasons in terms of improving your resilience, improving your community's resilience. And I think this is quite an important element of the climate change debate, because so often we talk about carbon or carbon equivalent and about greenhouse gas emissions and about limiting those greenhouse gas emissions. But it's not just about that. It is so much more complex than just about limiting greenhouse gas emissions. That is unbelievably important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting it isn't. But there are a lot of other issues. Because if we just look at limiting greenhouse gas emissions, local isn't necessarily the best option. There may very well be imported foods, particularly fruit and vegetables, that you can get from across the other side of the world where food miles really doesn't matter, unless, of course, they've been flown. That is, that is a, a definite no-no. What is more interesting is when you ask questions and you're being inquisitive about who is growing my food? How can I help them? I went to a fascinating um, talk by um, Kareen uh, from, I think she's from the London School of Economics about asking these questions. Someone in the audience was saying, well, what about young farmers? And her answer to that was, that could be one of the questions you're asking about the food you're growing. So if you are buying food from the other side of the world, are the people who are growing that food getting a fair price for what they're growing? And if not, why not? Are they being able to feed themselves? Are they polluting their own water and air because of the requirements that you are putting on them <clears throat> if you're demanding your food to be too cheap? Those questions are actually relevant here as well. Are you insisting on cheap food, which is therefore insisting on a far greater requirement on the environment in terms of air quality, in terms of water quality, in terms of animal welfare? Ask these questions. And if you can say, well, I know the answers because I know the producers or I know something about the producers, that's great. If you can't find the answers, why can't you find the answers? Because so often, if those answers are being shrouded, it's because it's all about money. And it's all about control of very large organizations where the people matter so little. And if the people matter, matter very little, it means the environment matters very little, or even less than the people involved. Food is a really difficult thing because there is an argument, well, we have to have cheap food so that people who are poor can feed themselves. At Nourish Scotland, we don't actually agree with that. Absolutely, people who are poor need to eat and they need to eat good quality, fantastic food. There is no reason that they should be eating less quality food than someone who brings in thousands or hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. 
But you don't deal with poverty by making food cheap. You deal with poverty by tackling poverty. They are two interrelated but also separate issues. What is actually key is your health, is our health, is everybody's health. And if we started to look at food as a way of maintaining excellent health, it all of a sudden changes the conversation. Because in fact, there are as many obese people who have a lot of money as there are who have very little money. Malnutrition is something that has all sorts of faces. It may mean that people are really hungry, or it may mean that people have way too much calories to eat, but are still nutritionally deficient. And this is where the meat question could be framed. There is a lot of discussion at the moment about meat versus vegan, for example. But in fact, I would argue that this comes back to my first suggestion, that we're all a little bit kinder to each other. So much of the discussion in the world is about, I am right and you are wrong. I am from one country, you are from another country. We all need to be separate. I believe in Brexit, you don't believe in Brexit. I believe in independence, you don't believe in independence. These are all consistently black and white issues. But in fact, everything is gray. There is grayness in our world. And it's only by being kind and compassionate that we understand that grayness. Reducing our worldwide meat consumption is absolutely integral to the survival of our planet. Sorry, let me repeat that. It's integral to the survival of the human species on the planet. The planet is going to carry on regardless of what we do. But that reduction in, in, in meat eating doesn't have to be completely life-changing in terms of making all farmers go out of business. That is also not what I'm suggesting. And in actual fact, it's not what most scientists are suggesting either. A reduction to levels that perhaps my parents' generation knew as children in terms of the quantity of meat that is being eaten is one suggestion. There is also the thought that we have this amazing grass-fed industry across the UK and the only food that can come out of grass is high-quality protein in the form of um, beef and, and lamb. But in actual fact, most of our beef and lamb, even in Scotland, has some form of cereal involved in its feed. And most of it also has soya in the feed. Very few animals in terms of the overall picture are fed purely on grass because there is this drive for bigger, better, better in inverted commas, animals. Because that, if you have more animals, therefore you get more money, therefore it's more profit, but it doesn't actually work like that. Because if you have more animals and you're feeding them more compounds, then actually you have less profit. A farmer that I um, am working with in the Highlands has reduced his sheep flock by 20% and has increased his profit levels because he is having to bring in fewer inputs. We have sheep at home and we have reduced our numbers because we were spending most of our cash on buying feed for the animals. And at a small scale, it's really difficult to know exactly what you are feeding them. I've been doing a little bit of investigations into that and even though I try as much as possible to make the best possible decisions it is quite clear that there is soya in the feed that we are feeding our sheep and that isn't necessarily a choice that I have made but it is part of the system so we have reduced our numbers over the last year and probably will continue to reduce our numbers as we realize that the amount of land that we have doesn't actually facilitate the numbers of sheep 
that other people have suggested that we could keep on our land. But these are complicated issues. They're complex decisions that need to be made by every single one of us. My mom has been in hospital um, three times over the last year. She has um, COPD, and I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this. Um, but it has been a fascinating journey as I've learned more about COPD as, as a disease. And in Scotland, we have some of the highest rates of COPD, um, basically lung disease. And there could be all sorts of reasons for that. But what is quite clear is that the numbers of people with COPD are actually rising in Scotland, despite the fact that you would suggest our air pollution is reducing, um, smoking bans, and so on. And you might ask me, well, what has this got to do with food and climate? Well, there are people all over the country who have got long-term illnesses, despite even starting to talk about our, our current situation. And as I sat in hospital and saw the amount of waste and the amount of plastic and the amount of energy that was being used, absolutely necessarily, I'm not for a second suggesting that none of it should have happened, it's really changed my view about how important food is in terms of the climate change discussion. Because if we can get our food right and we can get our health right, things like our dependence on the NHS will reduce our instances of obesity, our instances of diabetes, and potentially actually even our instances of things like lung disease will reduce because air pollution is also directly related to nitrous oxide emissions from fields and ammonia um, but it's a quite a more complex um, picture so i think i've probably spoken enough for now um, there is a, a publication <clears throat> that nourish scotland have produced called the food atlas which is available on our website and the Food Atlas puts into numbers some of the issues that I've talked about today and far more actually that I haven't had time to. Um, from biodiversity to the status of our soil, our health, our communities, our veg, and how they're all linked into food and how we manage our food. Just want to say thank you so much to Margaret for organizing this. I know it's been quite a mission. <laughs> um, but this topic will only increase in importance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Takesha. I hope you can all hear me. Um, and right, good. Thank you, Avril, for letting me know. Uh, I'm just going over to gallery view so I can see everybody. Um, so, does anybody have any questions at this point that they want to ask or point, or points they would like to raise? Right, there's no fingers going up, so I, I'm going to ask a, a question of Keisha, actually, um, which I, I think is, is implicit in everything that Keisha said, but um, it's the issue of food waste and, and how do we even begin to deal with food waste in this country? Do, do, are there any points in, in Nourish's guidelines or work that actually could point us the way forward with regard to food waste? Food waste is absolutely integral um, to the whole issue. In the United Nations um, IPCC report on land, um, food waste was identified as absolutely cornerstone um, to combating climate change. Um, a third of food in the world is wasted. In the developing world or in the global north, <clears throat> as some people prefer to, the vocabulary keeps changing, but in the global north, those, um, that waste is usually at consumer level. And when I say consumer level, I don't just mean in households, but also in restaurants um, and to a certain amount in supermarkets, but actually they've got much better 
um, about reducing their, their waste in the global south or in um, what would have been called less developing countries that waste is actually um, on farm or before it gets to, to shops because of a lack of proper um, storage facilities because of um, extreme um, weather events and so on that they don't have um, the proper facilities to, to manage. Excuse me for a minute. <clears throat> so there are two different ways that um, food waste needs to be dealt with. And you could say, okay, well, we're in the global north, so what happens in the global south doesn't really matter. But when we're importing so much of our food from there, be they lentils or rice or, um, you know, uh, pasta or whatever, <laughs> actually it does have a, a direct influence to what we're doing. Um, the most basic point about food waste is to buy what you need. And unfortunately, what we've seen over this last week is a perfect example of how people are not doing that. I am really worried about the amount of waste that is going to happen over the next two weeks as people don't eat all of this food that they've bought that they didn't need in the first place. I mean, fingers crossed they've got freezer space and that's where they're going. But over Christmas, um, I watched someone in the supermarket buy, um, what are those things called that you eat? Uh, Yorkshire puddings. So they were ready-made Yorkshire puddings in three lots of plastic, and they were trays of 18 at a time. And uh, the gentleman said to his partner, um, well, how many should we buy? Should we buy three? Should we buy four? And she said, oh, just buy four, because it doesn't really matter. But actually, it absolutely does matter. One of the thoughts, though, is it's a cultural change because there is, a, there is the idea that if we have surplus, we're being generous. And therefore, if you have a, a huge table covered in food, it looks, it's, it's an example not just of your status, but of your generosity and your, how nice you are as a person. And that's, that's quite a big value shift that needs to happen to actually recognize that we don't need to show that abundance all the time. Even um, a meal that I got had at a restaurant, you know, the quantities of food that is on a plate could be reduced and then they could be ordering small amounts of money. So anyway, that's big chat. You were asking about actual solutions. Scotland has been doing amazing things in terms of collecting food waste. And that's fantastic because it's diverting the potential methane that would be released um, from that. And the methane that comes from food waste, I would directly associate with anthropogenic emissions, which has to reduce, which absolutely has to um, be reduced. And the only way that we can do that is by wasting less food. So I have a compost bin. I have three compost bins, actually. And I'm sure, Margaret, you have a compost bin at least hundreds <laughs> um that is that is one way making a shopping list before you go shopping so you're actually meal planning is another way um of course there are always going to be issues of children not finishing their food um but maybe give them less food if that's not if they don't want to eat all of the food that you've put on their plate give them less to begin with and then give them more if they're still hungry there are, there are ways around this, um, but I would suggest that just thinking of produce, making a load of food, say a supermarket, for example, and then going, well, all the surplus we're going to give to a food bank, that is not a solution okay. because the food bank shouldn't exist in the first place. Right. Yes. Are you, are you muted? No. I've, I've just unmuted myself here. Yeah, that was one of the, the things I was going to ask. There's a couple of points actually come in. Um, yeah. One point, uh, I don't know whether the person that said it would like to speak, I've unmuted her. If the public learn to value food to its true value, food waste will naturally reduce as people focus on, will focus on how much it costs. As, for example, supermarkets, um, encouraging that attitude with the three for two office and this kind of thing. Uh, do you want to come in on that and expand at all, Catherine? Or are you happy just to leave it there? 
Hold on, can't hear you. Catherine, we can't hear you at all. You're unmuted at this end. No, sorry, we still can't hear you. Felicia, did you want to say anything about that? Because I can't, at the moment, Catherine, I think it must be on your device, you need to unmute yourself, Catherine. I think it's um, absolutely we need to properly value our food. Um, the, and I think the one of the definite options and solutions that came out of a WWF report on um, climate change and agriculture in Scotland at the beginning of this year said that organics was one of the main ways um, of reducing emissions um, in terms of a whole system change. And some people would argue, well, that's then going to cost more money. However, I would actually argue that organics potentially encapsulates how much it actually does cost to produce food that is um, at, a, at a high quality level, but also in terms of the um, other environmental um, considerations and consequences that come into place. I think there is a danger, though, saying that um, if people uh, are spending more money on their food, there will be less waste because there are obviously certain elements of the population who have very little money, so they count every single penny that's going towards their food. But there are other elements of the population who spend huge amounts of money on all sorts of things. Um, you know, and they, they don't necessarily have an idea of how much money they are spending or not. So I don't, I think it's actually about a consciousness of what they are doing as individuals and what the impacts of those elements are that are outside the impact on their wallets. I think too often we assume that people are motivated by their wallets, but actually the influences are so much wider um, and normally actually come down to emotions rather than 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 their wallet okay thank you do you have how to this question uh yes so yeah have you got any thoughts or good examples about getting large-scale procurement right i'm thinking about food for schools hospitals etc so in ayrshire they have done amazing things about local food procurement and some of this will be connected to um, climate change, but actually they were doing this long before climate emergency was announced. And instead what they've managed to do is have really short supply chains and a really good relationship with um, the producers in their local areas. At Nourish, we would recommend going even further and actually suggesting that there should be a really high organic um, percentage of procurement because procurement in fact is is absolutely key to making huge large-scale shifts by for, by providing a market but also by ensuring that there is good health amongst our our kids who are at school amongst the people who are in hospitals again when my mom was in hospital and even with my son who's at school the food that they got in both of those institutions are calories they are definitely calories and they're definitely you know meeting whatever the basic guidelines are but i'm i'm not convinced it's good food and that could be absolutely well and actually i think it will be there's a piece of legislation that we're all waiting for with bated breath called um the good food nation bill and there is the op massive opportunity in that to make huge um uh, changes uh, particularly in terms of procurement Um, I see that, um, Elspeth, you've written, the Danish did a very good effort at obliging public food provision to go organic until a change of government interrupted progress. In fact, that progress has continued. The Danish um, have been amazing. Um, so something like 75% of households in Denmark buy some organic food. 
so that's quite um, a mark of showing that it doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily a particular sector of society that's buying organics it is across the board 75 percent. it doesn't mean they're all it's all organic i think organics still only make up 12 percent of the overall food that is sold in denmark but yes the schools in particular have made massive um, progress and in copenhagen in particular um they have uh, they have very high um organic standard or organic provision a man from um the danish i think it's called the ministry of food uh, that i listened to a couple of weeks ago was saying the reason that they have managed to make that change is because they've changed the focus of how they deal with food to become something that is all about gourmet and they don't mean gourmet in terms of high-scale restaurants even though that's where it started but actually about massively embracing the the wonder of food so the taste and the smell and the excitement around that um, and by doing that, it's meant that people have become, again, emotionally involved in, in the whole system, um, rather than it just being seen as something all oh, we have to do. Uh, I mean, there are implications and differences of, of how that actually works, but it is a, it's an interesting way of, of approaching the problem. So rather than just seeing it as a really kind of dirty issue to solve, but looking at it in terms of joy which I think is really fascinating. Um, so Elspeth has said again, why has the UK been so slow in taking up organic and why is it still the first thing to go off the shelves? Uh, off the shelves? Um, do you mean, you don't mean as in bought off the shelves, you mean taken off the shelves to replace with something else? I'm assuming, I, I don't know. Have I successfully unmuted? You are unmuted. Sorry, right, I wasn't. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's just that um, we're, you know, when we go into shops, um, non-organic shops, supermarkets, and look for organic, organic milk is always the first thing to be uh, not available. You know, there's always plenty of non-organic milk and non-organic bananas. But there's a demand for organic that isn't being met in the UK, we think, in mainstream sources, you might say. So there was, um, uh, Kantar produced a bit of research just last week about organics across the UK. And I think we've got to be quite careful in that what we see up here in Scotland is not the same as what happens down in England. I think um, in England, you can get a much higher percentage um, for organics. So I think if you are an organic producer, you're probably focusing what where you want to sell your product probably down in England. There is also a massive processing issue um, of all foods and not just organic, but up here in Scotland, which means that we're in a really odd situation at the moment where almost all of our dairy products are sent down to England to get processed. So if you are then able to get better markets in England, there's probably the high likelihood that it'll then just go on. Um, it's a far more complicated question when it comes to dairy in terms of organics than just simply um, whether or not the, the supply chains are being met. Only 10% of um, UK supermarkets sales are in Scotland, which kind of makes sense because we're about 10% of the population size. But um, it does mean that there will then be a much bigger focus in terms of, um, you know, down to England. Whereas with fruit and veg, um, you know, I think we have way more opportunity to increase our organic fruit and veg um, production and consumption up here in Scotland. Is anything much being done in Perthshire on the soft fruit side of things for organic production? Mm, not that I know of. No. Um, Elspeth was wondering about org um, organic soft fruit production in Perthshire, if anything has been done. Oh. Fortunately, we have lots of raspberries in our own garden. Not on a large scale.
Hello. Sorry, Elspeth, I didn't hear the last bit. All I said is, fortunately, we've got we grow all our own raspberries in our garden. But you know, I, when we're out and looking for soft fruit, I always look for organic, and you just can't get it. Strawberries, raspberries, blueberry. Well, occasionally blueberries, but I think they come from America, don't they? But, uh, So Andrea has asked a question. I'd love to buy only organic, but in mainstream shops, organic fruit and veg is often not available. And if so, much more expensive than non-organic alternatives. What can be done to make organic food more widely available and affordable for all? So to answer that question, I, the, yes, it is more expensive, but that's not because it should be cheaper. It's because the other food, fruit and veg is too cheap. Um, you know, it's, it's, that should be more expensive to begin with. Um, in, in my opinion, um, I think that the people who are working in those areas aren't being paid enough. Um, it's, it, 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 yeah, it's just, it's a much bigger question. Um, and in terms of how would we be able to make them more available, um, in all honesty, I, I don't know. I think um, mainstream shops, for example, large supermarkets are really tough to make any impact on. Um, so I, I try and get my veg from, from smaller scale places. And then when I am in Tesco, for example, I, I now always buy organic and I know it's more expensive and I know it's wrapped in plastic, whereas the other alternatives aren't. But I do believe that every time I buy more, it is sending a message. Um, and I can only hope that that's going to have some kind of an impact. Uh, Keisha, if I can butt in there. Um, there's a message come through from Pear Arno, um, which may not have come onto, onto the everyone thing. Um, Pear is asking if that you have any views on the style of farming used on the NEP estate, K-N-E-P-P. Uh, so this is um, a wilding question. Um, almost, um, what was the show, Game of Thrones? <laughs> We're not talking about that kind of wilding. Um, so this can be quite controversial. Uh, for those of you who don't know the NEP estate, um, it's down in England, it's quite near London. So they have access to a huge um, number of people. Um, it's a large estate, a very large estate that's been in the same family for a number of generations. And that they found even with their um, high capital wealth in terms of owning this large estate and they had tried all sorts of diversification options, they still were not making any money at all. Um, and the degradation of their land was, was enormous. So after um, spending some time in Kenya, I think, and then also going to visit the Netherlands, they decided to start rewilding um, their estate and basically just left certain sections of it. It, it, it was section by section rather than all at the same time um, to start mimicking the African savanna. So they changed the type of livestock they had to being things that were more like what, the, what England would have had uh, a few hundred years ago. Um, no fences um, and basically just, just left it to see what happened. Um, and they are able to uh, harvest a huge amount of meat from the the boars. Well, they're actually they're not boars. I think this is a, a quite an old traditional breed of pig. Um, the particular type of cattle that they've got, um, as well. I don't think they're actually growing any um, any harvestable fruit and veg or cereals. They may have cereals on some parts of their their farm. Um, and it's been fascinating. It's been really interesting. The amount of butterflies that have come back are huge. The um, fauna and flora across their property are absolutely amazing. The dung beetles, which are a huge representation of the success of the soil, is really important. And I think the rewilding aspect 
is actually for me most important in terms of what happens with the soil so if we have healthy soil we have healthy ecosystems um, and I, I think that it can be an option um, for specific parts or areas but I am not convinced by the UK Climate Change Commission's suggestion that um, we should basically intensify our agriculture into sheds. So for example, have loads of pigs and poultry to allow bigger areas where we rewild. That, that for me is a, is a non-starter because well, if you're looking at it purely in terms of carbon emissions, yes, those intensive situations can have lower carbon emissions, but the ammonia and the other um, the waste issues of those systems and the animal welfare issues of those systems need to also be considered. Um, I would suggest that there is an option um, for more efficient production. I don't think in the UK and particularly in Scotland that we are at all efficient in how we produce food. But with less chemicals, um, we in Scotland waste half of the nitrogen that is put onto field. Half of the nitrogen. I mean, that is a huge amount of money that farmers are losing um, on an annual basis. And in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that that produces is, is really high. Um, and we could be integrating things like agroforestry really well. So um, planting trees that are integrated with grazing, it will really help with um, animal welfare. Uh, it'll extend grazing seasons. Um, it provides a whole new raft of products from the, um, in terms of berries, medicinal products, um, wood alternatives, not necessarily for um, building, but it could do, but for things like woodcrete. Um, you know, we just need to become a little bit more uh, creative with how we use our land. Um, I think the other thing though about the rewilding, which is quite interesting, is that none of those livestock are being fed on cereals as far as I'm aware. And a huge amount of our land, particularly in Scotland, is used for growing animal feed. Last year, there were more vegetables, large scale vegetables grown in Scotland for animal feed than there was for human consumption. Now to me, that's, that's, that's quite a frightening statistic. Exactly. Yes, a very inefficient way to make protein. Um, but also, there's a huge amount of our land that is producing whiskey. You know, the grain that goes into the whiskey industry in Scotland is enormous. And if you're then talking about health and the requirements of our nation as opposed to an exportable product, um, then, you know, we've, it's not a question a lot of people want to touch because it's too important to our economy. Um, and perhaps also too important to Scottish culture. Um, but, you know, there are, when we're talking about rewilding, it isn't just about food. That's not just what we're using our land for. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, thanks. For that um, just a couple of things before going on to Steve's question, which is the next. Um, Frida has come back to organic producers or fruit in Perthshire. Tay Bank Growers Cooperative at Blackhall Farm in Spitalfield. I have to say, I, they're, they're not certified organic, but they are growing organically totally. So that's one solution. You can go, will be able to get fruit from there. Um, Frida, come back if you want to say any more about that. I can't see you, but I can hear you, or I could hear you. Um, and then we have the question from Steve. Do you want to go on to that one next, Keisha? We've got about another 10 minutes on. on okay. okay. Oh, we can go on a bit longer. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure we need to hear everyone's thoughts, though. Um, cheap food producers are degrading the environment in comparison to organic producers. So it's there an argument for a polluter pays policy for food production. In energy, fossil fuel producers need to buy green levy certificates, which are then used to fund renewable developments. Could something similar work for food? 
how do we prevent nutrient degradation of the soil? Is it correct that over the years, veg produced on land has got less nutrient dense? Just a few complicated questions there, Steve. Thank you. Right, let me start. Sorry, um, it's the, the, it's Mel's question. Let me start with uh, your first question about cheap food producers are degrading the environment in comparison to organic producers. Those cheap food producers are producing food that you, you in general, not you particularly, Steve, are buying. Um, so my argument would be that the consumer, and I don't just mean the consumer as in us as individuals going to Tesco, I am including the enormous multinational um, companies who produce food for uh, um, catering and for um, hospitals, for example. I'm including all of that. They are the ones who I would argue need to be paying a better um, a better amount for the food that's been produced and also demanding better food but also meeting that with with pain there have been countless studies into asking questions of people would you buy organic food and they say yes of course we would and then they go into the supermarket and they don't buy the organic food there is a difference between us as consumers and us as citizens and the things that and the wants and needs that we have as citizens are not necessarily fulfilled in the marketplace um, because of all sorts of structural issues be they as Andre's question was before simply the food is not available for us to buy in the first place and um, so we have to buy lower quality versions um, to not having enough um, money to be able to to buy those or to be able to buy any you know any food at all um, so I don't think it's as simple as uh, the polluter pays policy in terms of food production. Um, for energy, yes, if, uh, the energy is really complicated though, because in my personal opinion, energy companies um, have been the worst, the big energy companies have been some of the worst in terms of putting a, a, a cloud over the reality of what's actually happening in climate change. Um, so I think they've got a far bigger um, burden to bear than any of the food producers um, for now. However, um, you know, I think, think I'm not suggesting things don't have to change for everyone. So your second question um, was about how do we prevent nutrient degradation of the soil? So that's something that we at Nourish are working on really strongly. Um, the that we've got a climate um, plan which is being produced by Scottish Government at the moment and then going into Parliament um, as well as a new agriculture bill and what our recommendations are going to be is that every farmer needs to have a proper soil analysis done that is paid for by the Scottish Government and that soil analysis is not just about the pH of the soil but it is also um, works out what the carbon is of that soil which is then revisited five years later it also takes into account what the um, nitrogen content of the soil is and a whole raft of different measures so that the farmer then has the opportunity to see what their soil where their soil is at and how to improve on it i know for organic farmers this is supposed to be something that they do um, i think it's on an annual basis not in terms of the carbon because you can't see a change in carbon content of your soil over such a short time. But at the Oxford Real Farming Conference that I was at in January, there was an organic, a certified organic farmer sitting in the audience and he said he doesn't ever bother to do soil testing because he didn't ever think there was a point to it. So it isn't just in your high intensive farmers that there needs to be a mind shift. It has to be across the board. Um, in terms of your question about is it correct that over the years veg produced on land has got less nutrient dense? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that some people would argue um, that varieties of fruit and veg have been grown to make them sweeter, not necessarily more nutrient dense, whereas I would suggest that we should be looking for high nutrient quantity rather than sugar quantity. Um, but James Wong, who um, is a botanist and probably knows a lot more about this than I do, he has a lot to say on Twitter. 
a lot of which I don't agree with, but he claims that the nutrient density of fruit and veg is the same as it always has been. Um, I think in actual fact, the question about nutrient density is about the lack of diversity we have in our diet in terms of fruit and veg. And if we had a more diverse diet, then we would have um, a greater quantity of nutrients. Um, there is a, um, a point here that says, um, the average person in Scotland eats only three portions of fruit and veg a day. And only five vegetables account for half of our consumption of fruit and veg. So that, you know, that's quite, even if you're eating the most nutritionally dense carrots in the world, if carrots are all you're eating, it's, it's just not enough. Thank you. Um, there's quite a few things coming up. I'm just going to unmute. Um, right. Uh, okay. There's there's lots of questions um, which we need to sort of start winding winding up on. Um, first of all, more suggestions of places growing organic fruit. Um, Linda's iPad says Belfield Organics, Tomaha, that's a common croft um, garden there. I was hoping Judith might be here today, but she's not got in yet. Um, Catherine from Herdman says Garfield grows in the Castle Gallery, new growers in the natural growing of vegetables. And you'll see there's the uh, link into neighbor, neighbor food. Uh, and the hubs that are being set up, which is certainly that's all going to go into the information package that goes out to everybody. Catherine sent me some lots of info about that, uh, and, and also Pillars of Hercules, which are technically in Fife but still in Scotland. Elspeth reminds us that the field at Dunkeld community growing space there, um, growing food for the local community. So there are quite a lot of options. Um, I would probably add in there, the community orchards also have soft fruit and top fruit sections usually, um, and make use of them. Um, anything else that we want to pick up from there? Oh, Christian's comment um, about hydroponics, or bioponics, biopon bioponics, using country feeder. feeder. <laughs> Yeah, um, so hydroponics, um, I don't know very much about biophonics to be honest, or um, is it bioponics rather than biophonics maybe? Um, hydroponics is quite interesting. Vertical farming is supposed to be the savior of Scottish agriculture, um, according to many, and I am due to go and visit uh, the vertical farming set up at the James Hutton Institute um, in June and find out a lot more about it. Um, I have a lot, and there are lots of benefits of the system. You know, if it's inside, then we've got extreme weather events um, in terms of, you know, the changing climate, then perhaps that increases resilience. Um, but I personally have a concern about hydroponics in that a lot of it is based on growing lettuce. And I would argue that most lettuce is thrown away. It looks nice on a plate and is chucked then afterwards. Of course, if you're a member of Percy Organic Gardeners, you love your lettuce. So, you know, I'm not talking about everyone, but I'm saying if we're talking about a bit of lettuce on a plate in a restaurant yeah. um, that is next to your burger, a lot of that is thrown away. So I think there's questions about what the hydroponics is being used for. I also have a question about the health. There's it's the, the very beginning of the conversation about the importance of um, the ecosystem of, of soil to the ecosystems of our guts and our microflora. And I have a concern that if we don't have the access to those um, mycorrhizal fungi that are in the soil that are then brought into whatever we're eating, um, because soil is no longer part of the system, whether or not that will have a, a change on the you know, and how our guts perform. Um, and I think the health of our guts is fundamental to, to the health of, of humans in general. Um, so I think there's, there's pluses and minuses. Yeah. 
because we've what we've been doing at home with all this COVID, we've been trying to work oh, hang out. Hang on, she's what... saying something. So, hang on a minute. Say that again. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I yeah. can. Yeah. So it was just because now with all the COVID and food security, we've been thinking about right what grows in the garden, what grows for example we like tomatoes they don't grow well because we don't have a greenhouse so we're experimenting with drip feed inside the house now and it's just all trying to rather than yes maybe as an alternative to see that some bits can be hydroponics um in conjunction with or i guess maybe it's more for a group of of people like us who are experimenting how we can more self-sufficiently feed for them but it's yeah i just wondered in how far that hydroponics was was taken up in in the wider food production so it is it's it's something it is being touted as the the solution the silver bullet but i am no silver bullets um i don't think silver bullets exist <laughs> you yeah. know i think i think it's about a combination of lots of things the same with energy production i don't think there's any one particular option it's about you know um a whole m mix um also the other thing about hydroponics is about the um energy use you know, depending on where you're getting. The yes, yeah, yeah. Stuff. So if that's all off renewables, you know, then maybe that's fine. But if it's not, then yeah, it's a complex question. Yeah, yeah, we, we did we did have this discussion because we're we're, we're all renewables and we've worked out because with, with salads, for example, they don't taste nice from the shop. They're wrapped in plastic. And, and it's the whole, and knowing, like we all know when we grow them ourselves, it makes such a difference just from the, the flavor that you get. And then we're working out the amount of plastic or the travel miles against the setup at home once you set it up. And so we're, I've just tried it in the last month. So I'll, I'll report back. So we're trying all sorts of different like rafters and dripping systems just, and also from recycled materials. So we're not buying stuff. So that's why I was wondering with the um, bioponics. So I'm currently making a comfrey solution, but again, I'm trying to work out in with within that what grows and what not so it's just a i guess just an experiment we're doing yeah great well we'd love to hear more <laughs> thank you that's um the comments are still coming in now and i'm actually going to read through the last comments in case people haven't got to them they're all really really useful things that need to be covered um, and we will have further discussion meetings we can home in on the topics that seem to be important and uh, you know everything connected with food especially at the moment is so important to all of us um, so yeah Frida has added that um, Taybank growers are chemical free and no dig and managed to supply raspberries in their veg boxes last year so you know it's um, it, it is coming. Catherine has said that mycorrhizae uh, are also very important and complicated, um, but, but the use of mycorrhizal solutions to encourage um, the growth of vegetables and fruit can't be overlooked, I think. Um, is there anything else that I've missed out on? Yes, absolutely, yes. Um, so Frida's also made a point about um, she thinks the uncertified organic because it's behind a paywall. So Nourish is very involved in trying to come up with an organic strategy for Scotland. And there is a recognition um, that not only do does organics cost a lot of money to become certified. We try to become certified organic and absolutely balked at the cost of it because it doesn't matter how big or small you are in terms of um, signing up. Um, and sorry, <clears throat> we as me and my husband, not we as, as Nourish, but my boss, uh, Pete Ritchie at Nourish is certified organic. Um, so what we are going to be recommending is that actually the um, certification fee is dropped and is paid for by the government mm -hmm. so that producers don't have to pay because in actual fact, that's the opposite to the polluter pays principle. You're paying for producing in a, in a different way. Um, so that's one suggestion, but also the other point is that a lot of uh, vegetable producers, um, for example, Tom Nahar, as far as I'm, I'm pretty sure, they're on less than three hectares, which actually means that they don't qualify for any um, subsidy, any agricultural subsidy at all. 
and okay, fine, they might not want to have the subsidy, but it also means that there is no access to um, advice for any of these smaller producers, including ourselves um, at home. So um, by removing that requirement, uh, well, by removing the requirement to pay for the organic certification, it also means that it will then apply and is accessible to people who are on less than three hectares um, who are not getting that other subsidy. So we're, it's something we're very aware of and we're trying to stimulate um, in terms of an, a new organic strategy for Scotland. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, Catherine, last chance to come in. Um, can we, if we can hear you, can you hear Catherine now on the last point? Try again, Catherine. Sure. I can nearly hear you. <laughs> there she is. There we go. I can hear someone. No, I don't think it's going to. Not happening. I can, I can hear Philip. <laughs> Did you want to ask a question, Philip? No, I didn't. No, I'm sorry. I was just scratching my chin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I'll, um, we'll, we'll draw the first session to a close. And I'd like to thank you, Keisha, for a really, really comprehensive and inspiring talk. That was really, really good. It's just what we need at the moment. And thanks to everybody for your fantastic contributions. And if your contribution was listening intensely, I can see a lot of your faces and you have either fallen asleep or you are listening really intently. So thank you all for that. Um, I'd now like to hand over to our second speaker, James Murdoch, Jim, from Extinction Rebellion, who is just about to swap places with Keisha. Um, Jim told me that he was going to be very, very flexible with his talk, as he doesn't want to cover the stuff that Keisha's covered already. Um, so, welcome, Jim. Now, in, in Keisha's place, and I'll mute myself and you can go away. Uh, hello all. Um, I'm extinction, part of Extinction Rebellion Scotland. Um, I'm outreach coordinator for Extinction Rebellion Stirling, so I enjoy getting out and about and talking to people about the climate crisis and what can be done. Food security and um, food production is one of my uh, things that I do get quite uh, involved in, but uh, Kesha has kind of um, dealt with that uh, quite comprehensively, so I'm not going to talk about food. Um, and things have been changing so dramatically over the last few weeks that a lot of what I had already thought of, um, I've had to kind of change. Um, for example, in terms of um, energy usage, uh, currently in the North Sea, it costs uh, the companies about $32 a barrel to bring their oil up and get it landed. And the current oil price is around about the $26. So it's actually costing them money. So our whole infrastructure is going to change with this coronavirus epidemic. We're going to have to learn how to do things differently. Um, in terms of transport, well, so many people are being asked to work from home. And 20 years ago, I ran a company called Telework Scotland Limited, and we were a bit ahead of our time. But as the next few months will show, when people are working from home all the time, the, the local office managers are going to wonder why they have these huge buildings that aren't actually fit for purpose anymore because people won't want to be going back in and uh, sitting in rooms of two to 300 people uh, at computers and telephones. Uh, it's one of the things that are, 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 go are going to, to change quite considerably. Um, Extinction Rebellion are 
have, have, have three aims realistically. And the first one is that governments actually start telling the truth about the climate crisis. And I've actually seen papers written to the White House in the 60s that basically told us what we're currently starting to um, uh, suffer from. The, the, uh, the bigger storms, the warming climate, these things all were known and um, companies like ExxonMobil, they actually suppressed that, they actually fought against um, that being taken, the, the science being taken on. So we're, we're in this situation now where we're having to actually going to have to react very quickly and change so many aspects of our lives to thinking global but acting local. Um, I've mentioned energy, we need, to, uh, Scotland has actually run off renewables uh, for considerable periods of time over the last few years, and that's only going to get better. We need to stop driving our cars so much, we need to telework a lot more. Um, that's going to change the way we use our houses. Because if we're running a, a teleworking office in our own home, we're going to need space there. We're going to need better insulation so that our um, energy costs are lower because energy is still expensive. Um, that's going to create a huge number of jobs. Just simply getting enough renewables out there for, for our energy needs and to reduce our, our energy costs in our buildings. We're going to have to come off gas and utilize things like ground source heat pumps and uh, air source heat pumps. I watched a while back, I watched a very interesting YouTube video of a greenhouse uh, in Nebraska where they get, uh, it's, that's high plains and gets very cold in the winter, but uh, these greenhouses are growing citrus. And uh, that's pure and simply because they're using the heat from ground source uh, tubes feeding into the greenhouse and with solar gain they're getting adequate heat there so we can actually do an awful lot more with a lot less. Um, it's going to, our consumption patterns are going to have to change quite considerably. Um, neighbour food was mentioned just, just recently and that's one of their things is to try and reduce waste because they're only delivering what food is actually being ordered rather than everybody buying what's needed. And we, we've seen this with the panic buying over the last uh, 10 days to a fortnight. It's just, it's been outrageous. And as Kesha said, a lot of that is likely to get wasted unless everybody's freezing everything. Um, the second thing about Extinction Rebellion is we want governments to actually act as if it's uh, as according to the science. And we can see that what we were asking for was considerable reductions in our carbon footprint, not just a carbon footprint, but over the, over the whole gamut of uh, environmental uh, issues. Um, One of the few ways that either governments have to actually come in and do things from top down or they have to, what we really want is citizens assemblies to actually make these decisions for the government. There is a citizens assembly in progress at the moment, but that will probably be derailed by the fact that we can't have meetings anymore. I've yet to read up on that one. But uh, some of the other things that uh, concern um, Extinction Rebellion is the fact that we're undergoing huge species extinction. And we've all realized recently that we no longer scrape the bugs off our windscreens. Um, in the summer, it used to be you had to get the credit card out and two or three times a month. I noticed that five, six years ago, and it brought huge thoughts of a book I read in the early 70s called Silent Spring. Where, we've, where we lost all our pollinators. We lose all our pollinators 
that really impacts very badly on our, on our food security and our ability to produce food. One of well, pollution, plastics, we have no idea what the amount of mi microplastics in the environment is going to do to us. Is, we, are, we are in completely new territory for so many things. Um, well, we're in new territory with this coronavirus. Um, we've yet to see how that pans out. Um, the re most recent ones are saying that we're going to have to do social distancing for up to the next 12 months. And nobody knows how that's going to pan out uh, at all. <coughs> uh, some of the other things that we've been looking at is we really need to, well, there was going to be the huge climate camp this summer to uh, try and sort out some of the issues with Moss Moran and the environmental impacts that they're having there, the, the over flaring that's been done and the carbon emissions from that. It's not just carbon emissions, it's the pollutants. Um, Moss Moran Action Group have been working at this one for years and not getting anywhere. So the climate camp decided to help help out and do something big there. We need to see if that's going to um, actually actually happen, but it's not looking very likely anymore. Uh, what else is there? Um, it, there's the way we trade with um, other countries. Is it right for us to import um, tomatoes from North Africa, Morocco in particular, when they're destroying our aquifers to produce our food? It's the global north, the rich north against the, 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 the poor and the global south um, is the, the cliche that goes with that. Um, how we consume really links into all of these things about energy, about transport, about buildings, and about how we trade. Um, the shops are empty now. Retail is undergoing huge changes that they just don't know what's going to happen. Um, we're on track at the moment, if we don't change anything, for approximately a three to four degree rise in global temperatures. That's going to make so many things really, really difficult for us to deal with. And I'm not, the, the, a lot of these questions are questions we don't have answers for. This is the, the, the to me, the slightly terrifying thing. Um, however, there was a paper produced about a year and a half ago called um, Deep Adaptation by a professor, Jem Bendel, um, who was a professor of sustainability development at uh, Cumbria University and he spent the last 20 years in this field and he thinks it's actually probably too late for um, us to avoid some of the worst effects of this global climate crisis that we're in. However, he is, what, where he's coming from now is the um, there's got to be love in this deep adaptation to create resilience in communities. And we have to have love for ourselves as, as Kesha started off with, and that we have to have love for one another. And that's the only way we're going to get through a lot of this. It's not by panic buying and hoarding, it's actually being community-based and aware of the environment that we're in. Um, we have to change so many aspects of our lives and we've got to do it quite quickly. Um, I'm not sure really, as I said, so much has changed over the last week to 10 days that I was no longer entirely sure what I was going to be talking about here. So I've kind of come to a little bit of an end of a road at the moment. If there's any questions we can go on, we can maybe expand on that a little bit more. If there's any issues that you're interested in from Extinction Rebellion's point of view, um, we can, we can um, see how we can expand things.
Um, okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks, that, that was great. Um, there are a couple of things that are actually coming um, on the Zoom group, Zoom group chat. Sure. Um, I'm just waving goodbye to um, help with the audiovisual side. Um, Elspeth um, read an article which I, I actually saw reference to this on social media as well. Um, from 1912, which showed that people recognised the impact Indeed. of increasing carbon dioxide even then, and yet we carried on increasing it, which I think is you know, pretty amazing. So the, 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 the energy companies have been using exactly the same uh, tactics as the tobacco companies used. Um, misinformation, um, discredit the science. And this has been going on for decades. The amount of money that the, um, the, the classic one is Exxon Mobil is one of the biggest because they actually did the research and then buried the research and then argued against the research. And now you can actually look at that research from the 70s and they actually got it damned right. They were very close to what the models are currently, what we're currently experiencing. I knew 30 years ago that climate change was going to make Scotland wetter, quite simply wetter. And we've had, I mean, I now no longer enjoy winters because they're just wet from October all the way through to, to March. And it's just, I walk dogs for a living, so I'm out there on a daily basis seeing wet paths and I'm covered in mud, the dogs are covered in mud, and it's just, you don't get the crisp mornings that you used to. We are actually seeing this. I'm seeing tree level, uh, tree line rising. Hills I've walked up for over 50 years, um, the tree level's up about 30, 40 feet, and that's a simple, um, that's done by temperature rise. Tree line is a function of temperature. Temperature's gone up, tree level rises, and um, so we can we can see this happening. I've I can see this happening over, over my lifetime, and the CO two rises that we've been seeing over my lifetime are absolutely shocking. So we have to do things and. As Greta said, if we all do something uh, as well as pressure our governments, it all makes a difference. Um, did that help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that just sort of requires some you know, emphasis that we, we, have, we have sat on our hands again. Um, Mel has a question which has come through to uh, via Steve. Um, and it's a very direct one. Do you think there's a danger that climate change focus um, will lessen in terms of government policy and efforts that's both UK and Scottish government in light of COVID-19 and the need to resource it. It's not going away. Um, coronavirus will to an extent become manageable at some point, whether there's a whether we either get a, a, a worldwide immunity or whether there's a, um, a vaccine we will learn to manage and adapt to it, but um, climate change is not something we can adapt to very simply. Um, it does, to, to create resilience in our societies, we're actually going to have to seriously change how we do things. Coronavirus, well, as I said, we will adapt to that one way or another, um, however, however it works, and the government is choosing how that happens, I think. Um, is that where you is that yeah, making sense? Join it, join XR, and let's make it a bigger, bigger movement. Uh, Extinction Rebellion has taken all our meetings uh, um, online. Now we are using Zoom quite a lot and various other um, medias to, to, to stay communicating. And I know yesterday there was a large, um, it was actually youth, I think it was youth climate strike that would actually led it, but they were targeting several companies um, by People just emailing in, phoning their, their uh, call centers, and uh, basically 
making their social media side of things not work anymore and blockading them electronically. So you can do things, these are, these are not arrestable actions, so nobody's going to get into trouble for them, but it shows the level of commitment that the general population have about getting stuff done. And uh, so it, actions still can be taken without blocking yourself, gluing yourself onto whatever, or sitting in the roads, which is not very, very viable at the moment. So there, 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 there are a lot of people out there who are being quite inventive about let's, how, how else do we put pressure onto Shell, for example. Um, it's, it's how we're all communicating at the moment is by, by various um, teleworking structures and social media. We can do this, we can mail bomb them, we can make their lives difficult, tell them that we're actually not happy with what they're doing. There's lots of things coming in, but I'm going to jump to the last one from Jude, Jude Green. Um, XR are truly fantastic, and I agree this is how we go forward together. So I think you need to leave us lots of information and links to go into our big. Indeed, seven. yes, I will. I will I've, I've got uh, there's a number of various um, channels that we use that people can get, get involved in to communicate with. Uh, on all sorts of aspects of, of, of our life because I think there's 40 to 50,000 active members at the moment and uh, there's a lot of people putting a lot of effort yeah. and a lot, of, no that's just UK, that's just UK. Um, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger worldwide. Um, there are more African countries coming in, there are more teams being, it's a self-organizing system and the amount of effort that people have been putting into writing papers, organizing um, stuff and just thinking about things because we have to think out the box, out with the box because we all live in this toxic environment. We're all part of the problem, we all drive, we all, drive, we all use supermarkets and you know supermarkets are part of the problem um I, every time i go into a city i see houses 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 oh there's a little there's a supermarket um food security to me is one of the the serious things because we're only about nine meals away from um effective social collapse hungry people if the supermarkets are empty and the people are hungry yeah. three days and people are going to say the hell with this uh, I'm going I, you know, you've got food I want some of that food and social collapse is 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 becoming closer if this isn't dealt with in a, a loving and caring and inclusive manner I'm going to um, put in there uh, the next question on the list actually which it's in um, Hashmi has asked are you lobbying for a more eco Conscious restart of the economy after the COVID crisis. That would that would be my understanding of, of how, how we're working at, on it. Reduction in meat eating, um, so therefore more plant based diet is built in almost to this to the structure of, of uh, extinction rebellion. We are rebelling against the potential extinction of the human race. This is where the name comes from. And as such, we've got to do everything we can. Um, the, the, the fundamental, uh, Roger Hallam and Gail Bradford, two of the founders, um, the way they put it out was we need to do what happened at the start of the Second World War. The economy was turned around on a sixpence and put onto a war footing to do what was needed to be done. Nobody said, how much is this going to cost? This is what needs to be done. And this is actually the way the government has actually treated, is now starting to treat the coronavirus epidemic is, to hell with the cost, this needs to be done. And the fundamental is, in, uh, uh, if we have social collapse, we have no economy. Um, you can't have growth when there's social collapse. So therefore, this needs to be done and done fairly quickly. Um, the IPCC report said we need 
45% reduction in the next eight to 10 years. Well, they actually said 12, but that was two years ago now. So this still needs to actually happen. Whether it does or not um, is, is up to us. The governments will listen to us if we put enough pressure on them. And um, that's where the original concept for the, the mass demonstrations in London was talk, talk to the power. Go down there, that's where the power is in, is in London. That's why London got shut down. And yes, it's disruptive, but that's the only way to get noticed. A, a one day march doesn't do it. Um, it needed, that's why we went for a week or two weeks to make sure that, look, we really can shut this all down and look what happens. The rebels fed themselves. It's a regenerative culture that we have in Extinction Rebellion, whereas where we look after one another. Um, at every protest, at every event, there's always somebody there on sustenance to make sure the rebels get fed. Uh, there's a, always well-being to make sure that people are looked after if they're stressing out because protesting is, is, is exhausting work and it's emotionally draining. So there's well-being people there. There are police liaison people to make sure that the folk that are getting arrested are looked after. Um, and a story, one of my friends was one of the first arrestees last uh, October in London. When he came out of the, the cells the next morning, there was people to meet him with a cup of tea, an oyster card, and some breakfast so that he could get back to his, his tent and got a couple of hugs and it was just, it made him feel, it's, we welcome everybody and every part of everybody in Extinction Rebellion. Who you are doesn't matter, it's, you're here. That's the fundamental. And it is a caring culture. Um, it's so, that's the, fun, the fundamental is also non-violence. And anyone that takes on any protest already has done a nonviolent direct action training program so that you can understand how you can stay away from microaggressions that what the police want to do is they want to get you to actually react to them, um, especially with anger. They know how to deal with that. They don't know how to deal with uh, passive resistance. Um, so there's a, there's a whole heap of things going on here that, uh, with Extinction Rebellion that, yeah, it, it, it is a cultural shift. There's a cultural paradigm shift with Extinction Rebellion about this regenerative culture. It is community-based, it's uh, inclusive. Yeah, which is good. And people do need to understand that we are talking about legal and Non-violent. Yes. You obviously well supported. Um, I'd like to go back to the economics after Hashmi's question, um, because Alsop and Jude have both um, emphasised a particular philosophy which I know a little bit about, but not enough. And that's donut economics. Um, Alsop says Kate Reynolds donut economics network has come up with the notion that we no longer talk about developed and developing countries, as we should all view ourselves as developing countries in our need to pursue a new sustainable future. Um, Donut and, economics, I haven't come across. I assume it's some variety of a circular economy. Do you want to say something else, Rick? I've unmuted you. Ooh, um, yeah, Donut economics. Um, can you hear me? Say that again, Elspeth. Um, donut Economics uh, came out of some work that um, Oxfam did um, on the back of Earth Science, Johan Rockström's work in the noughties in 20, 2008 or some nine oh, or right, something. Yes. And, he, and, and they used a sort of pie chart model of his ecological limits and it comes to a sort of social minimum foundation in the middle of the pie chart to make a donut instead of a, a single pie chart. And they have, um, the, 
there's a too long a story for me to go hide <laughs> it here. But ha have a look at Kate Rayworth's website. Have a look. Have a look at. Well, definitely buy the book and read it. Go on to all the forums and chat rooms and initiatives that have come off on the back of this. Yeah. Um, and it's a and it's trying to create a framework where we can place the economics of the future so that it addresses the needs of people and planet instead of pursuing G GDP as this mission to nowhere. Ab ab abso absolutely. Um, you, can't, you can't have infinite growth in a closed system. Well, the, sub the subtitle to um, Donut Economics is Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. So it's all about regenerative, redistributive, blah, 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 inclusive, the whole thing. So it's, it's what we should all be exactly. thinking about it's in terms of a framework for going forward, forcing the economy to fit into that model instead of hitting ourselves against this brick wall of climate change and mass extinction and everything that the current economic um, yeah. system yeah. does. The, the, the current economic system is forcing us into that into this um, because the inequalities are getting greater. Mm -hmm. I mean, back in the back in the seventies, I used to go along to the uh, seven eighty four theatre company productions because uh, seven percent of the population owned eighty four percent of the, the land. I think it's an awful lot more unequal now, and we're dominated by 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 the neoliberal um, capitalism. That has to change, and I, well, in fact, at the moment we now have in a, a number of seriously right-wing governments that are now producing seriously socialist um, responses uh, mm -hmm. to, to 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 this crisis. So I'm I'm thinking it's actually quite positive on certain levels that this epidemic is actually showing us that there are better ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. There are different ways of doing things, and we've got to find them. Otherwise, we, we are we are doomed. Uh, so, um, yes. Um, yes, it just um, because somebody has made that point. Catherine has come in and, and said a very valid point. Everyone will be more able to see that they can change, having been forced to do it by COVID nineteen. She makes a really good point. Mm -hmm. And Keisha just pointed out to me, just to remind us all, that actually the Scottish Government has a legal obligation to carry on with their um, action, well, their proposed action. It's actually the Climate Act. The Climate Act. It has passed. Yes. So, so they, they have to carry on with that. They can't sort of wash it under the carpet and say, oh, well, no, we need to be too COVID-19. So that's maybe a bit of yeah, I, 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 was, I was down at the um, climate camp at Holyrood uh, last year while we were deba debating uh, the, the, that, that very act, that bill. Um, and we had quite, quite a few conversations with MSPs and such like. So that they are, the, the politicians are aware of the issues. Whether they choose to do anything about it is yet to be seen. Which is where, where Extinction Rebellion really still needs to push because a, a net zero by 2045 is still far too far away. Um, by 2045, well, by 2050, we're probably looking, as I said, at at least two to three degrees rising. Things will be, will be difficult. Things need to actually happen an awful lot faster than any of the current governments are actually saying. That's why Extinction Rebellion is still, from my perspective, required. And we need, we need to continue to push. The climate crisis is not going away. Uh, it will still be there once we've got COVID-19, uh, once we've got on top of it. Um, who knows, there may be another one coming down, the, another epidemic coming down the line that uh, where we will, um, the we were we were told it wasn't a matter of if this ha if an epidemic like this happens but when it was going to happen we the, the the people in charge knew that this is always possible i think uh, the, the comments that have been coming through and, and going up and down a wee bit um 
you, you can all see them on your screens anyway. Um, this reaction to COVID-19, uh, Andrea is not very uh, optimistic that the government is going to not try to go back to business as usual. So again, we really, really have to uh, make sure that, that doesn't happen. Um, she says, I think the only way that things will genuinely change would be a total collapse of the system. But this would mean hardship for millions. That's a scare. No, that... no easy answer. So, um, social, yeah, social, um, yeah. Over up, um, and, and I've been sort of um, keep coming back to, to Claire's comment here. There is a common theme emerging, which is reducing waste, don't waste energy, don't waste food. The question is, how do you get everybody to do this? When our socio-economic system is all about fiscal profit and fiscal growth. Um, and Claire goes on, perhaps reaction to COVID-19 will help start the substantial changes required. Yesterday, yesterday I, I live in a very small village. Uh, but yesterday, there was a leaf that came through the door. There's uh, the local uh, community council actually printed a leaflet with a number, number of volunteers and things that you can either be helped with. Um, so I'm actually seeing community starting to start to come together. Now, it's more difficult in a city, I dare say, to create these tight communities. Maybe not. It's a while since I lived in the big city. Um, um, I'm just being told by Kesha that there's a lot happening, but I, I, I see that I see that extinction rebellion in in Edinburgh and Glasgow because I'm involved with them too. And it's this community based. We have to learn to care for each other on a community level much more, and that's part of the regenerative culture of extinction rebellion is we actually have to because i've, I've just started to help start up extinction rebellion strathern and um is based in creef it's a small group but it's going to get bigger because these people will get to know one another and will be able to, to to help out and care for one another um, when things get tough uh, and things are getting tough right now you know because that dreadful um, story of the nurse that came off the 48 hour shift to go to the shops and found basically the stores were empty and was in tears. It, it went viral. Um, that was just two days ago, I think. You know, we have, uh, yet there are some hugely great stories of um, health workers being supported. These are the ones, these people are the ones who are going to be supporting us, so we need to take care of them. And I think there's a chance that we may come out of this with a much more caring society, especially if we have to practice social distancing for the next 12 months. And because we will just need to take care of the, the vulnerable, the poor, the sick. Um, I mean, I'm not getting any younger. And so I'm probably in one of the high risk areas. And, uh, you know, I've been keeping a social distance but you still have to take care of as many people as you can and keep society together on, on, uh, on, on, a, on a local basis because that's where you can work. Um, do you know, I, I've unmuted, um, well, I've unmuted. Andrea and Claire, do either of you want to, to come back on your comments on that before I go on to the next? Uh, hi, I'm um, sorry, I can't, I can't hear you very well. Can you repeat? Repeat that. Hi. You know each other. Uh, we've, 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 we've met, yes. Yeah, hi, Jim. Thanks for the values. Can you repeat your question, Margaret? I couldn't hear you. Um, it's just, if, did you want to come back at all, Andrea, on what, what you said and on Jim's response? Um, well, um, <laughs> I don't really have anything more to add. I just feel like I, I guess I feel quite pessimistic about this, um, about anything changing after this crisis. Um, but yeah, I do. I do hope that um, that you're right. That there will be. There is definitely an opportunity to change, and I hope. I hope um, that we will as a result of this. Yeah. Well, that that's where I was coming from in terms of the um, if people are having to social distance, they're not going to be going into a call center 
to work beside another 400 people on the same floor. They're going to want to work uh, because they can work from a, a computer and telephone at home. Um, and the, the business managers that are looking at, at this are going to have em empty call centers and going, well, why do we have this? Um, so we will, I, I think we will see changes in the way certain things are done. And I think it's up to us to make sure some of these changes actually get, get taken up. And we, um, especially from my perspective of Extinction Rebellion, to actually push for these. Um, whether it's uh, email campaigns to our MPs and MSPs and politicians. And so on. I think that's probably quite a good way of doing it, but um, there are many people out there with loads of great ideas and there will be loads of workshops available for people to come in with their own ideas and how they can how they can interact themselves. Um, I just wanted to respond to your point NJ as well is that there are some really positives in the food systems being seen the um, demand for food boxes or um, local weekly food boxes from independent producers has gone through the roof. So there are changes, I think, on a systems level that are going to be happening. And yes, you may think that it's not enough and the government may be planning on business as usual, but I think there may be enough change in terms of our food supplies that that isn't actually the case in the long term. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, just going down questions again. Um, Rajani says, totally, this could be uh, an opportunity to mitigate the downturn in the economy. Governments will invest. It, this could go into renewables and the right industries, or it could go into fossil fuels, like after the 2007 economic crash. Um, I'll just make sure I haven't missed anybody out that's gone off the page. No, I think I'm up to date. Oh, uh, Linda made a... a, a a point when we were talking about energy um, that there are lots of greenhouses in Iceland using geothermal uh, energy to produce quite exotic fruit and vegetables uh, very easily they're very good with tomatoes um, so yeah if we have the right sources of energy renewable energy we can actually grow things that wouldn't normally grow in Scotland um, Catherine has pointed us towards a very interesting TED talk, if you're probably all aware of the TED talks. This one in 2015 was by Bill Gates, warning about a virus and the state of the economy and governments paid no attention to him, which doesn't surprise anyone. Um, Jude, how to involve and support children positively with these values at the moment? Um, the evidence I'm seeing is that children have the values better than a lot of the adults. But yes, do you think yes, uh, ab absolutely. Um, I was at the climate strike, uh, youth climate strike last summer in, in Creef, and the energy that they have is, is phenomenal. Um, there's also Extinction Rebellion have a, a We Rebellion uh, group, um, which is mainly uh, in mothers and young children. Um, but the, 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 child, the children see the fires in Australia, the, the floods uh, all over the country. They, they see disaster after disaster on television. Uh, I mean, they are not just simply passive consumers of cartoons. They're, 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 they're now, I have two grandchildren, one's four and a half, one's twelve. And they know there's things going on. Um, it's, it's almost inescapable um, to, you know, you have to really have a uh, fire in your head and sand and not to know that there's a lot of stuff going on in the climate. And, you know, the bushfires in Australia were just, in fact, not just Australia, um, California. Arthur's seat last summer had a fire. 
um, highly found out about that about a month ago, but uh, saw the footage of it and going, that really brings it right home to, to right here. Scotland is one of the greatest countries I've ever been in, to be quite honest. And we're, we're still having uh, bracket fires on the side of um, artists in the centre of Edinburgh. It's completely crazy. Yeah. Um, Catherine is suggesting that um, we get children growing food. Again, um, if my children are anything to go by, and one of them appears to be here, um, they, are, they don't, I don't have much difficulty getting them growing food. They've taken it on board, and my children are obviously um, full, fully adult. But um, something that we were talking about this morning was that although a lot of us are quite wrinkly and, and knocking on a bit now, um, we've kind of grown up with this ap apocalyptic um, feeling at the back of our heads that someday we're going to need to know how to grow our own food and find our own food. And that's all seems to be coming home to roost. So, yeah, anybody got any experience of getting their children to grow food, negative or positive? Keisha saying negative. <laughs> But I will keep but get, when they get bigger, they'll, they'll do it. Jim? Uh, the last house I had, a uh, 12 by 8 greenhouse with, I uh, used to always grow tomatoes every year. Um, both my grandkids used to love going down there and taking tomatoes fresh off the vine. Um, it's the same with strawberries. It's about getting them involved in it. They don't, the kids still probably don't eat a great amount of veg. There are certain things they won't eat, but if you get them in starting to grow their own things, it's, it's surprising how they take a seed and they either get a flower or they get fruit or a vegetable. Um, it's not that difficult if, if you give them the right, right incentives and a bit of encouragement, I think. That's me personally. Um, when they used to come round down to visit, especially during the summers, it's can we go out and see what's in the greenhouse? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so for me, I, I think it's not too difficult to get them involved. They love being outdoors. Um, mind you, I also kept hens. They also loved going and uh, collecting the eggs and mm -hmm. um, feeding the hens. So, they're starting to understand where some of the food comes from. This is one of the things, one of the issues is we are all tremendously, most of us are tremendously disconnected from where our food comes from, where our clothes come from, where everything comes from. Um, I mean, I'm way back I'm an from an engineering background, and, but my father was uh, a lifelong member of the South Carolina Society, so I spent a lot of my childhood in other people's gardens and greenhouses. And so I, I kind of knew what was going on. And I'm kind of not good at a farm, so you know, I've, I've milked cows, I've made butter, and taken from there. So I, I see it quite, quite, I'm quite au fait with where the food comes from and systems if the, if the children are, 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 are shown this and grow up with this it becomes second nature i think one of the things that um i'm very pleased about is that since the days when i was a primary school teacher in london and started a small garden practically every school in that you you can think of has got a school garden mm -hmm. so things have moved in that way now, there's a point from Elspeth, which I, I can't see on, your, on the machine. I don't know whether you can bring it up, Keisha, so Jim can read it. I'll read it out anyway. Read, read, read it out, you're fine. Um, another great way of looking at how things need to change is the premise of what is behind the Women's Equality Party philosophy. In our current economy, we talk about investment, good, and cost, bad. Historically and still, we invest in and pay lots for what has typically been men's work, um, law, bridges, roads, technology, and keep costs down of things which have typically been women's work, care of children and elderly, education, cleaning, food, etc. 
We now need to flip this and start properly investing in the latter and reducing our wastage in vanity aspects of the former. Well, I, now. I, 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 quite, I, quite, I quite agree. Um, I'm now in my early 60s, my children are both grown, but uh, when the children came along, neither of us wanted to be the sole breadwinner out at work all day and coming back. Um, I was a better cook than my wife. Um, so I was quite invested in, in, in childcare as, as such. And uh, we both ended up working part time most of the time. So I, I, I agree with those sentiments exactly. Um, I think it should be much, much more uh, equitable in terms of childcare and, uh, let me just read, yeah, education. Um, my OCD meant I always liked to have a very clean bathroom, so I was the one doing cleaning. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was a bit of an outlier here, say, 40 years ago. Um, it's nice to see, uh, see this coming through. Um, I have no issues with the moon feeling. All right. Um, so I have no, I have no issues with, with, with any of those sentiments and agree with them entirely. Uh, however, we are still in a very patriarchal um, society, and so society needs to change somewhat. And I think we the start of a big change in what we're, what we're going to see in terms of society, because. People that are having to self-isolate at home with their partners are going to be spending a lot more time with them than they would with their children. Um, you know, the schools are now all closed for an indefinite period, so people are going to have to learn new ways of working with yeah. their families, their children, with their neighbours. Uh, I, I see great social changes happening in the next year. Thank you, Jim. I'm Keisha's. Uh, laptop is about to lose its battery so All it's right, going okay, to be removed so from you <laughs> i have to move with it so it can be plugged in we are nearly at the end now i, I think anyway um Alfred has has put in a comment here um back to the involving children uh, again for the last 10 years i've worked with local schools and nurseries growing food learning about where their food comes from and also cooking with it children love growing and eating their own veg in my experience yes. Um, we're getting thanks to people that are, are now just about ready to leave. Yeah, yeah. So, um, shall I wind it up? Yes, that's I probably wind, good. I will wind it up. Thank all, thanks to all of you for coming, including those of you that have, have just left already. Um, I think it's been great. There will be more. Um, seminars, uh, more seminar form meetings, not quite such long ones. Thanks above all to Jim and Keisha for coming and spending their time uh, in very difficult circumstances. And we're all trying to keep two meters away from each other here and it's very difficult to remember to do that. So thank you very, very much indeed. And that's been great. And um, yes, I hope to hear from you in the future. Can I just remind you of the Facebook group there's comments still coming in, and, and please use the Facebook group. And please, can somebody else post on it other than me? i um, really like to see some other people posting on it. We can keep these discussions going there and, and emphasize everything that's been done. My laptop has successfully, I think, recorded this whole session, despite me kicking it off the table twice. Uh, and I will also make sure that all the chat goes out in the um, dissemination document anyway. So, I don't know if that, there will be a button to say to unmute all. I don't know where it is. Right. It's going to unmute you all so you can all wave bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>